Hi and welcome to Astronical. Today we're going to look at and build something called a ZX diode cart. Quite a, well I think, quite an advanced diagnostic cart for your ZX Spectrum. Let's get started. Is that it? <sighs> so here we are, it's unopened, so it's an unboxing too. It's a kit. I think you may be able to get them assembled for a little bit more cash, but this comes mostly as a kit. I'm using very unsafely an exposed scalpel blade because I've lost my loader for my scalpel blades and I'm not sure where it's gone. So that's them two catches there. I must have something that we need to do there. Now this, I will put links in below for where you can buy this. The designer of this sells them directly on his website and that's a place called Bite Delight. I will put links for that up, but I actually bought this in from the UK because the Bike Light website, the Bike Light person is in Europe and I will say I will put the website below and the cost of posting it to, to the UK was, it was adding up a little bit, whereas if I bought it from a UK seller, who's obviously bought in bulk from the Bike Delight designer, then it actually worked out cheaper. So they must have got a good deal on importing, you know, quite a few of these and they're selling them on, but even though they're gonna make a little bit of profit as well, it's actually still cheaper to do that, to buy it from the UK than it is to actually order a single unit from, from abroad. So let's have a look inside, see what we've got. So we've got lots of pressy packaging, a little clicky pressy packaging. So okay, so oh, we've got the main circuit board. Looks very good. Bike lights written on the side there. Uh, so look at that. A nice black circuit board. Looks pretty cool. Even cooler if I could get it out of the uh, envelope. Yeah, looks all right. So some components are assembled for you. For example, there's some very small surface mount components there and over here. That's been done, leaving you with just the through-hole stuff, which is not too bad. So we can all do a bit of through-hole stuff, can't we? All clearly marked, so we'll just pop that over there. That's slightly out of camera shot. We've got our chips here, by the looks of it. And the edge connector, I believe. There you are. There's the edge connector plug into the spectrum that'll solder onto there. I would have thought that way around. You see, there's a gap there, keying gap. We can see there's a keying gap there, so that's going to go on there, solder there, and that will plug into your spectrum. There's no case comes with this, it's just an exposed board. I suppose you could 3D print yourself one. So, yeah, we've got the sockets on one side and the chips on the other. I won't bore you with the rest of the unpacking. All I'm doing is I just go through all the little component bags and it's got all the capacitors and resistors, etc., LEDs, or the little bags, all very clearly marked, all with little labels on, showing you which packet in they are. Fantastic. So, get rid of the box. Let's go through and uh, we'll build it. I'll speed up various sections. I'll just go through each, each instruction and then we'll speed up the building process as well. So we're at the actual assembly steps and it says step one, solder on that diode and then do your resistors and the RC socket. So I'll do all those three and then we'll come back to turn over and go to step four. All parts are very clearly labelled. So on the instructions it says, step one, part number D1, diodes D1, part A8V2. Here we are. Even a one for step one. So step one, one times 8V2, then a diode D1. You couldn't ask for more. The attention to detail that you assemble this is fantastic. They've even been, I've just noticed, the components have even been, come on out, come on little Zener diode, pre-bent. Look at that. So I just have to slot it in the hole. Fantastic.
Okay, so that's all the diodes, well, a diode, sorry, and all the resistors soldered on. So we're now going to move on to the RC sockets. I've got all my RC sockets. Just take note of where the notches are on the board, obviously, and uh, set your notches on your sockets appropriately. Where's this one go? Is there? Yeah, that was there. Crack on. There you go. I've quickly just tacked a corner of each RC. I'll take off the sellotape now. Sometimes I'd use blue tack for that because there are a lot of chips that are raw sellotape seem the easiest thing to do. Otherwise, if it's just like one RC socket or so, it's a little bit of blue tack just to wedge things in place. Resist the heat quite well. So looking at that, yeah, everything looks absolutely fine. I've no problems with that at all. All looks pretty much flush of the board, so I'll go ahead and solder up the rest of the joint. Okay, so that's all the sockets soldered in, looks okay. The next step is the LEDs. Obviously when you're soldering your LEDs, let's just get the red ones out. Be careful you orientate them correctly. The longer end is the positive and the shorter end is the negative. And then on the board, it's usually also a small notch flattened on the negative side. And there is, but my gosh, they're hard to see on these small LEDs. But anyway, so short end negative, long end positive. And for example, this one's gonna go into D6. This is a red one going to D6. So D6 to D13 are all down here. These are all red ones. So when you come to put into your board, the you'll see the circle and a square on where the LED is going. The circle is the positive, the square is the ground or negative. So we want to put our LED in so that the long lead, the positive end of the diode goes in there and the negative goes to the square, the shorter lead. Now I've just paused there. I've put the blue ones in and I'm about to put the last LEDs in which these four green, these green ones, which is four green ones that go down here. However, just be careful when you're doing these ones. These all had all the negatives on the same side, all the negatives on the same side. These have negative there on this one, but then it's on this side on that one. And then this side on that one, and then the same position there. So just be careful, take a good look at your board that's short side going to the negative there, like that. In fact, I'm gonna solder one at once so I can double check that I've got everything right as I go along. And that's all the LEDs in place. The next step is capacitors. C1 to C6. So what I'm doing now is just putting the capacitors in Put in a little bit of blue to come, just to hold them in place while I flip the board and then solder them all up. There we go, take the blue tick off. Well, the tacks are available. There is white tack and possibly others. Okay, looking sweet. Next one is transistors. Should we just one of them to put in? Q6 BC548. There it is. One off BC548 Q6. Which is, I think that's just down there. Q6. And you can see the silt screen has the orientation for it, so we just need to simply pop that in there. Push it home. That's got quite a nice grip right to the bottom. Put a little bit of blue tack to keep it in place while I just solder so everything looks neat. Looks okay. Solder that up. There we go. Blue tack off. Blue tack is a bit soft. It's got a bit warm. Just get another bigger bit of blue tack, put it off. I've got a bit soft there. I think we've got it all. Yeah. 
Uh, I can't overemphasize the quality of this board. It's absolutely fantastic. Quality resistors, quality everything. Right, next bit. Pin headers and jumpers. J1. So J1 and J2 both require three pins on there. So I need to... Uh, I have actually got spares of these if I cock this up. It was like this would give you plenty as well anyway. I don't think they're used anywhere else but here. So let's break that like that. That's a three. Three. Ah, I've done another three. I want a two. There we go, two. So we'll get the threes in. Lovely. And then obviously you've got a jumper. I don't know which one is going to be the default. There'll be in the instructions somewhere as to which one is going to be a default jumper setting. But for now, I'm just going to put them both to the top. Uh, when I go through the instructions of this later, I'll check which one they need to be on for whatever setting it should be. So then we've got this two pin one, which is J3. Ooh. That bit, ROM 1, output enable. Well, it's not enabled, labeled as J3. That's got to be it. That has got to be it. It's two pins. I'm going for it. I reckon that's it. Get a bit of blue tack on there. Squidge. Right, I reckon that's it. Just hasn't labeled it as J3. Probably a very minor oversight, but when you get to this stage and you put most things on, yeah, it was fairly obvious that it had to be J3, in fairness. Right, I think we don't need any more of them. They can go back in the bag. There they go. Chuck that over there. Put this jumper on. No, I presume it's only a two pin jumper that this should be on most of the time. To be for some weird setting when you take that off, I would have thought. Get on. Oh, these are fiddly little beggars, aren't they? Go on, push. Why are you not going on? Are the pins slightly out of whack or what? Not sure. There we go. Got it. Right. I think we have very nearly finished here. The next and um, last step on my sheet, you just can't see it's off camera. Uh, second to last step are the switches. Let's get them out. Oh, and some rubber feet. So we've got the slidey switch. Ooh, nice. And two tactile switches. So a slidey switch is switch what? Switch S1, looking at my instructions. Single pole, double throw, it says as well. So switch S1 is going to be there, isn't it? Switch. Where it says S W, but that's going to be that, isn't it? Because the only other two switches will go there and there and there for thing. So let's whack that in. Get in. Which way up this goes doesn't matter. What matters is me trying to get the darn thing in. Ugh, it's a little bit tight on the. Very tight on getting that in. I'm just trying to stretch. That is slightly not fitting that. I don't know if you can see that, but ever so slightly doesn't fit there. So it's going to splay a little bit as I push it in. Um, that's a little, hopefully the switch will survive. It's ever so slightly not quite a fit. You can see um, that this, they've got an angle on them now. They're splaying apart. That's not good. I have been incredibly impressed with this, but that footprint for that switch is not matching the switch that's supplied. It's only maybe you know, a quarter of a mil out or so, but when you're talking, you're know, trying to fit these in, it, it uh, matters. Now, I'm not gonna push it any further, I don't think. That's as far as I think I dare push it. If it's splaying out, and will it push a bit further? It might do. No, we'll leave it at that. It's not bad, I'm fairly low on the board. I'm gonna solder up at that with a slight spleen on the actual pins. Okay, right, tactile switches. Right. 
There we go. Champion. Ooh, dicky. Ow. Also quite still hot underneath. Right, last part. The edge connector. Now, it gives some instructions here because you want to slightly bend the pins of the edge connector as shown on the photo, leaving some space for the board between the two rows. Sold on the edge connector with the key in the correct position, I showed that earlier, where there is no pad on the circuit board. Make sure it's orientated to the same angle as the board. Check from the side. Okay. So obviously the orientation is, we've got this missing pin here, we've got a missing thing there, so it's gonna go like that. Basically, it wants, these want to be squeezed together so that they will grip onto there nicely. And I think what it's saying when it's mentioned, leaving some space for the board between the two boards. Oh, it's saying don't over squeeze them to complete so they're almost touching each other. You'll not get them on. But you do want a little bit of a snug fit, just not quite touching so that they press on nicely there. So let's give these a press down. Um, I'll try on this on the matting. I might actually go to the edge of my table, which is harder, harder surface. That might work better for that, if I think it were so. Apologize, I'm just gonna go off camera a little bit onto the hardness of my table and just try and squeeze them down. It is quite hard to do. I've done them a little bit. I'm going to check for fit. One more press on this side, then I'll check for fit. Not looking too bad. Yeah, they're not bad at all. They're going on pretty good. I've over tightened probably on a couple going up at the top end here. Yeah, they're a bit too snug. So I'll just slip uh, edge of a screwdriver in there like that and just pull up and just try and bring some of them back out a little bit. That looks okay there. Might be a bit snug there. Let's give that a go. Yeah, and now it's actually a bit slack, but I think we'll get away with that. In fact, I can see that we, yeah, more, most definitely will. Nothing's, they're all pretty much just about touching. So that's not a bad job, actually. I'm relatively pleased with that. I just soldered the top and the bottom first and then heated them up and adjusted it so it was perfectly square with the board before carrying on and doing the rest of those solder joints. All right, that's looking okay. Last step is rubber feet. It says put them uh, just opposite these recesses here. Now, I'm not gonna put the rubber feet on just yet because I want to clean this board up with some IPA. Let's get on with that, give that a clean up with the IPA and then we'll stick the rubber feet on. So I've had a little clean up of the workbench and now I'm gonna have a little clean up of the PCB with some IPA. So we'll just move the instruction booklet out of the way and give it a little bit of a spray. So we damp down, let's put that lid back on the IPA. Next job is to get the ICs in. So let's have a look what we've got. So obviously you can see where some of them are going. Three of them are the same size. And in the instructions it tells you exactly what they are as well. We have three 273s. I think it's just some sort of buffer. I think, if I remember correctly. So they're going to be going there. So that's the only place they will fit. So I think Mike Delight tries to get these as uh, new old stock, or at least as best as he can. So making sure that the cutout notch is with the notch on these. So we'll put in these 373s, 273s first, which it says on the instructions we're going in U5, U4, and U6. So we'll do that. They have been pre-straightened very nicely. There we are, just the feet to stick on. I've checked as I was going along that the notches were in the right place, all facing that way. 
to the west. Right then, so we stick on the feet next to these little cut out notches. They are going to go over some of the pins, particularly on the other side. But the instructions say not to worry about that. They'll be fine. So I'll give it a good press down. So okay. So I should, yeah, sit very nicely. Right, we've got to go and plug them in to plug this into a specy and have a look at the instructions. I'll maybe look at the instructions first and then plug it into a specy. So here's my spectrum. This one is booting. So I know it's working from that point of view, but there'd be no further tests done on this, and this will be a check for this to see if it finds anything wrong with the spectrum. I'm not expecting too much wrong, as I say, it does boot. Now, we talked about these jumpers earlier in the video, and I just put them to the top because I didn't know how to set them, what I need to set them for. Looking in the manual, it says that jumper one, and you can see there, it has two little ones at the bottom of these jumpers. That means that's pin one, the middle pin will be pin two, and the top pin will be pin three, because these were three pins for each of these jumpers. And it says, for the jumper one, if I set it to the upper one like this, then it will boot the ZX Spectrum. We don't want that. If I set it to the bottom, so I'm going to take it off and put it onto the bottom two pins, it will boot the diagnostic ROM, which is what we want. So we'll pop that in there. Okay, so that should boot the diagnostic ROM. This one, jumper two, is all about a special line, a special signal on the Z80 processor. As I said, I'm not a big expert on Spectrums or Z80s, but there's the M1 signal, and you can choose to either ignore it or treat it as normal. It says in the instructions that um, if you are having problems with M1 line, this will pick it up. And I think the M1 line is not critical to the Spectrum for what I'm, I'm judging here, correct me if I'm wrong. So it will keep on working with uh, iffy M1 line, but it's saying here you should replace the Z80 if it does show there's a problem. You can choose to ignore the M1 line. I'm going to I'm going to choose to actually use the M1 line and we can see what's going on. There is some blue lights across the top here which have various signals from the Z80, such as non-masking inter interrupt, uh, interrupt request there, the M1 line that we talked about, uh, reset, etc. So that's certainly correct. Now this last jumper here, we can either have it on, these two pins, or off. And I figured that, obviously, I would have thought that on with the default, and it is, it's only taken off if you're apparently testing some Brazilian ZX Spectrum clones. Uh, I don't have any of them, so I'm not going to be doing that. But for every other Spectrum, every other Spectrum that there is, you have that jumper on. So without any further ado, let's plug this in. Oh, by the way, I have actually sprayed this Spectrum with contact cleaner. I just unplugged the composite mod. I have actually sprayed the prep spectrum with contact cleaner to make sure we've got a good connection on that edge connector. Uh, so that, you know, we're not flagging up a bit of oxidization there, making this not work properly from what we did. So pop that on there. Can only go in one way because of the notch. There's a notch on the ZX's, ZX Spectrum's board there and it can only go in one way. So we're gonna push that home. There we go, that's on. Got little feet on it to keep this nice and level. Pop that on there. And let's see if we get any problems or action from the car. Okay, this is looking really good. We've got lots of lights going on and off here, all the greens, the blues, and it's going through some tests. Now you can choose different tests by pressing the key on the keyboard as you power up. Obviously, I've not got a keyboard attached to this Spectrum, so it goes through a default set of tests. And there it goes. I'll speed this bit up. Everything's looking okay, but I've just noticed we've no action on the red lines. Now, in the diagnostic, one thing I didn't mention, actually, yes, is we have a switch here at the top. And that switch can be set to certain settings as well. If the switch is to the right, then the middle row of red LEDs will show the status of the data lines. If it's to the left, then they will show memory faults. So if it was memory bank zero that was at fault, this would light up. I think that's the idea anyway. So at the moment, I've got it set to the right to show the data lines. So they should be pulsing. And in fact, I think in the left setting, 
they should sort of pulse counting up like that, going to do like a straw thing, according to what I can see in the instructions, and they're not doing anything. So something's amiss with them. Hmm. Okay, so what have I done wrong? But I'm wary of how long this episode's gone on for, so that's for another day. Fundamentally, it works. Just a minor issue with those LEDs. I've got a couple of ideas what it might be, so I'll investigate them in another episode. That just leads me to say thank you all very much for watching. I really appreciate it. And obviously the patrons that support me as well. If you want to do any of that sort of thing, there's links down below for all sorts of them sort of things. Till next time.